This week's episode is brought to you in part by After the Fact, a podcast from the Pew Charitable Trusts. 30 years. Why does that number matter? It's been more than 30 years since a new type of antibiotic has made it to market. Now, I bet you're wondering why. A stat is only the beginning of the story. To understand the numbers shaping society's biggest challenges, listen to After the Fact, a podcast from the Pew Charitable Trust, available on Stitcher and anywhere else you get your podcast. Visit pewtrust.org slash science mag to learn more. This week's episode is also brought to you in part by KiwiCo. KiwiCo creates super cool hands-on projects for kids of all ages that make it fun to learn about science, engineering, technology, art, and math. Inspire creative confidence this year with KiwiCo. KiwiCo is offering Science Magazine podcast listeners the chance to try them for free. To redeem this offer and learn more, visit kiwico.com magazine. Welcome to the Science Podcast for February 8, 2019. I'm Sarah Crespi. In this week's show, I talk with staff writer Eric Stockstead about bringing the potato into the 21st century. This delicious and very complex tuber may face some trouble when it comes to climate change. And Megan Cantwell and Bob Service discuss a pill that gives you an injection once it settles on the bottom of your stomach and flips over like a little turtle. What could possibly be wrong with potatoes? Are they not the perfect food? Delicious, whether fried, baked, boiled, mashed, or saladed? Staff writer Eric Stockstead wrote a feature this week detailing all the planned improvements for what I consider the perfect tuber. Hi, Eric. Hi, Sarah. What is wrong with the potato? What issues should potato lovers be concerned about? Well, there's nothing wrong once it gets to your plate. Ah, But if you're a potato farmer, there are some longstanding challenges and there are new challenges arriving. Right. Well, what are some of the longstanding challenges of growing a potato? Everybody's probably heard of the Irish potato famine. Yeah. Late blight is the disease that triggered the famine in the mid-19th century in Ireland. And that microbial pathogen... That's been a problem for potato growers ever since. That hasn't been solved. The potato blight not, still isn't existing Not at today. all. It is probably the top problem for potato growers anywhere. And in the developing world, where you don't have fungicides easily available, it can lead to 15, 30% loss of the potato harvest on average every year. Wow. Is there anything else that makes it hard to grow potatoes? In my mind, you just stick a piece of potato in the ground or one of the eyes from the potato. That grows a plant, and then underneath the ground, off of the plant, you get tubers that you can harvest as potatoes. Potato does really well in different soils and different lights, but one thing that potato doesn't like is a hot night. If the temperature gets too warm, a potato plant won't start to make tubers, and then you don't have a crop. That's one of the key problems as climate change is happening. Many places, those temperatures at night are creeping up. And then there are all the other things that farmers have to deal with, frost or hailstorms, right? Basically, Mm -hmm. climate change is increasing the severity of weather and the unpredictability of bad weather. And Both those things are bad for any farmer and they're bad for potato farmers. When it comes to some of the other staple crops, rice, wheat, they have gone through this green revolution where they've been optimized and improved through all these different methods. But that passed potatoes by. Why is that? A lot of those improvements, the increase in yields during the green revolution that, of course, helped prevent famine, a lot of those improvements were due to breeding. In wheat, for example, one of the key things that plant breeders did in the 1940s and 50s was they shortened the stock of the wheat plant. That improvement meant that each wheat plant could bear more grain and it was far less likely to bend over in bad weather, which would ruin, could, could ruin the crop. Those kinds of changes happened in rice and in wheat and the yields went up. That didn't happen in potato. 
But why didn't the potato get the same green revolution treatment? Potatoes, and we can compare them with corn, for example. Corn has two copies of each chromosome, and potato has four copies of chromosomes, which makes it harder to improve the potato gradually compared to corn. It's hard to tweak it and make it a little better every generation. Having so many copies of these chromosomes makes it difficult because if you like a gene that's present in a potato, it might not get passed down in enough of those chromosomes in order to show up in the offspring, in the progeny, when you're breeding one potato with another potato. In corn, with two copies of the chromosomes, it's easier to predict what's going to happen in the next generation. If you've made a mistake, you can go back and make another cross and you can gradually improve it. Now, that's really not possible with potato. Potato breeders get one shot. They take two potatoes and they cross them. They have to grow 100,000 little potato plants from that cross and evaluate all of them. Now, once they find one that they like, if they tried to cross it again, you'd get a whole new mixture of traits. It wouldn't. You got to do 100,000 again. And you may not have the things you liked preserved from the last time you worked on it. What that means practically is that it takes a really long time to breed a new variety of potato. It can take 15 years from your first cross until you're ready to give it to farmers. And historically, some of these new potato varieties, some of them took decades to create. And you can't really improve on it. Like I said before, that means that if you make a really great potato, people just keep growing it. You know, the russet Burbank, it's, yeah. it's the best potato for French fries. You know how old that potato is? No. It's more than 100 years old, Sarah. And now it's still the dominant potato in North America. That's amazing. But it might not be as resilient as we want it to be when climate changes. So changing it is going to be tough. What about genetic engineering? Can we just stick a desirable gene into this russet potato and, and go on from there? There are some real advantages to using genetic engineering. Let's take the russet Burbank. If you wanted to make it resist bruising, you can take a single gene, you can make a single change and not alter anything else about the plant. You can't do that with traditional potato breeding. Okay, so what's the problem? Why aren't we just genetically engineering all these desirable traits into potatoes? Any of these characteristics that are complicated traits, yield, right. that's a complicated trait. And so there's no single gene that you can pluck out from somewhere else and put into the variety you want. Right now, those traits are bred in the traditional way, slow, yeah. patiently, and eventually you get there. I think we really need to address where these traits, where this variety is coming from. You did mention briefly that potatoes originated in the Andes, and there is an incredible amount of diversity still in potatoes there. Can you talk about what it was like when you visited and what kinds of potatoes you saw? It does blow the mind when you walk into a market in Peru and you see many of these native potatoes. They are all sorts of colors. They are all sorts of shapes. They have different tastes and textures. It's like an heirloom potato. It's not grown by big farmers. They are standard potatoes. They're consistent. The technical term is a land race. Compared to a farmer in the, in the United States who will grow one type of potato for hectares, a potato farmer, a small-scale potato farmer in the Andes will be growing dozens, sometimes more than 100 different kinds of potato all together. It's a dynamic and diverse way of keeping a real range of genetic diversity alive. How are farmers and agriculturalists and researchers taking advantage of all of that diversity? Are they taking some of these amazing purple potatoes and bringing them into a lab and then breeding them with the russet and trying to get some of that resilience or other kind of special qualities into what's been a standard potato for a long time? You might want to take a potato that's grown in the developing world and cross it with a land race that's high in zinc or iron. Oh. And then you could have a more nutritious potato. Or you might want to take a potato that can survive a frost or 
in an entirely different situation, you might want to take a potato that can grow well in salty soil to expand where you're producing potatoes. Some of these traits are found in land races. Many more of these traits are found in the wild relatives of potato. Are you saying there's potato hunters looking for wild potatoes and bringing them back and figuring out what their traits are? The thing about domesticating a plant is that you take something you like, a tuber or a fruit, thousands of years ago, right? People saw things they liked and they selected for those traits. So now we have big potatoes, sweet fruit, and you're doing it from a wild species, right? Just like the dog was domesticated from the wolf, the potato was domesticated from not a wolf, but right? Something that was <laughs> very good at surviving in the wild. So the yeah. wild relatives of potatoes, oh. right? You might not like to eat their tubers because they're bitter and small, yeah. <laughs> but those plants might do really well surviving against the pathogen that caused late blight, for example, or in, in a hot climate. It sounds like we have a good source of diversity, maybe some sources of resilience. Is there any plan in place to speed up the process of introducing those traits? We can't do it. You know, gene editing isn't going to work so well because there are complex traits. You might have a lot of different genes involved. Is there any way to go faster? To do that, to simplify the potato for breeding, you need to use potatoes that have only two copies of chromosomes, just like corn, rather than four. That still functions, a still functional potato that can grow and, and, and reproduce? Yes, potatoes can do fine with two copies of their chromosomes. Then you make them more genetically uniform in order to have these what are called elite breeding lines. You never plant these potatoes, but you use them to create potatoes that have great qualities. And then those potatoes are planted. We should talk about the other impetus for improving the potato, the way it handles, the way it grows, how efficient it is as a crop. It's because so many more people are eating the potato now than they were 50 years ago. Can you talk about the spread of the potato into the cuisines of all these different places in the world? I was really surprised, and maybe I shouldn't have been, to learn what the number one grower of potatoes in the world is. Should I guess China? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> but only because you said I'd be surprised. It grows twice as many potatoes as India, and India is the second largest grower. And both those wow. countries, for the last five decades, they have been growing more and more potatoes. Whereas Ireland, Poland, a lot of these Northern European countries, they're growing fewer and fewer. Do you have any ideas about why this change happened? They're really versatile and useful. You can grow in China, you can grow a potato in between your rice crops on the same field. Oh. You've added a new crop and new production and not taken away from anything else. If you grow potatoes, you're getting more calories per acre than if you grow wheat. They're becoming more and more important for, for food security. And they're delicious. And they're really good, yeah. I had no idea that potato was so complicated genetically or that it was so hardy, but that it also has weird issues with night heat. It's just really interesting. And that there's so much diversity maintained in South America. Thanks so much, Eric. I'm going to have to keep my eye on potatoes in the future. Good talking with you, Sarah. <laughs> Eric Stockstead is a staff writer for science. You can find a link to the article we discussed at sciencemag.org slash podcast. Stay tuned for Megan Cantwell's interview with staff writer Bob Service on a pill that delivers medicine by injecting it into the lining of the stomach. This week's episode is brought to you in part by KiwiCo. KiwiCo creates super cool hands-on projects for kids that make learning about STEAM fun. With a KiwiCo subscription, each month, the kid in your life, be it your own kid, your neighbor's kids, nieces, nephews, random kid on the street, will receive a fun, engaging new project, which will help develop their creativity and confidence. There are seven types of crates to choose from. We've got the tadpole crate for infants, the koala crate to engage naturally curious preschoolers like mine, all the way up to the eureka crate for anyone over 14, which includes most of our listeners and also myself. Basically, KiwiCo's mission is to empower kids not just to make a project, but to make a difference. Every crate includes the supplies needed for that month's project. 
You don't need to go to the store and pick up anything. It's all in there and you've got detailed, easy to follow instructions and an educational magazine to learn more about that crates theme. KiwiCo is offering Science Magazine podcast listeners the chance to try them for free. To redeem this offer and learn more, visit kiwico.com slash magazine. Ever since the introduction of insulin shots, there's been an effort to create an oral formulation. But the passage from your mouth to your gut is a treacherous journey. Acids and thick mucus can all spell trouble for a fragile molecule like insulin. I'm here with Bob Service, a staff writer at Science, to talk about what a pill form of insulin could look like in the future. Hey, Bob. Hey, Megan. What are the challenges to making a pill form of insulin? There's a couple of them. The first thing, our intestinal system has three lines of defenses. And so first, it has very highly acidic stomach acids that will cause proteins to unravel or denature. And then once that happens, there are a set of enzymes in our stomachs that will then chop those proteins up. Basically, our digestive system sees large proteins like insulin or other kinds of drug molecules as food, and it tries to break them down, and it does. You mentioned in your introduction, there's this thick mucus layer, and that basically is another way that the stomach and small intestine holds any molecules at arm's length, preventing them from trying to get through the stomach lining or the intestinal lining. And then if they do happen to even run that gauntlet that far, The cells of the small intestine are tightly packed together, which makes it really, really hard for anything to get through. What did previous pill formulations of insulin look like? Well, there's been lots of different attempts, and and not just with insulin, but with many kinds of molecules. And one of the ways they try to do this are with other chemical components that they add to them. These are called permeation enhancers, and basically they cause the cells in the intestinal lining to separate a little bit and allow those biologics then to wiggle in. But they tend not to be very effective for anything as large as insulin. They work better on very small proteins called peptides. Now, I think what we're seeing is a couple of different lines of of research. One is building on these permeation enhancers, and they're doing a couple of things. They add other components to them to hide the molecules, hide these large biologics from the stomach acids first. Then they also have compounds in them designed to prevent the proteases from chopping proteins up. That combination is one where researchers are trying to put all those pieces together to protect their biologic molecules. Then they're also taking this more engineering approach. So there's a paper out today in Science that describes a small pill that is engineered to deploy a very tiny micro needle once it's in the right position in the stomach. And so then what that does is it just injects insulin in this case directly across that barrier layer and into the bloodstream. And they've shown that it can work as well as a subcutaneous injection. How does the release mechanism in that pill work? Yeah, so it's pretty cool. So what they do is they've designed a little hollow pill that it sort of looks like an acorn without the cap, but it's got that curved, highly curved top, right? So no matter how it lands, when it hits the bottom of the stomach, it writes itself, it orients itself. So the the flat end is pressing up against the stomach lining. And then the moist environment of the stomach corrodes over a few minutes, a cap that is holding a spring, a loaded spring in place inside the capsule. So once that cover dissolves enough, that spring pops out and injects the insulin across the stomach lining. Although the injector is pretty small, are there any health risks from repeatedly puncturing the lining of the stomach? Sure. That's going to be an important thing that they're going to have to track very carefully because that, you know, frankly, that's a problem with permeation enhancers as well. I mean, you don't want anything causing any kind of lasting damage that's going to allow bacteria to get in there into the bloodstream. The researchers who did the work on the the pill injector, they studied rats and pigs over time. They gave them daily injections and they didn't see any problems with it. But this, of course, will have to be followed up with much longer term 
uh, health studies in animals even before people. As I'm not sure if they would be able to know this from the animal models that they tested on, but can you actually feel when the injector is in the stomach lining? They don't know yet because the animals couldn't tell them. Those parts of our body don't have a lot of pain nerve endings. And so there is another company that is pursuing a related strategy. It's actually quite similar with these pills with an injector. It's a bit different of a mechanism. It doesn't have a spring loaded. Rather, what happens is once it reaches the small intestine, the pH in that environment causes a chemical reaction that produces carbon dioxide. It's sort of like an Alka-Seltzer medication or something like that, where the the bubbles form and that this blows up a little balloon that has uh, a needle on it and that pushes the needle into the lining of the small intestine. They're called Rani Therapeutics. They're out of San Jose, California. They've done just a very initial study, safety study with people in which they had unloaded capsules. So with no drug in them or no, no injector, but they did have the balloon and people didn't even notice it. They couldn't even tell. So that's a good first step, but obviously they have a long way to go. This company, the pill is deploying in the small intestine. Is there any advantage to deploying in the stomach lining versus the small intestine? That will have to be seen over time. I mean, folks are going to have to research that very carefully. One argument is, is that if you're deploying in the stomach, you know that a pill can pass through your mouth and esophagus into your stomach within seconds. And so the timing is very clear about how long after that, that medicine will start to be injected and essentially deployed, whereas things can take a much more variable amount of time to go from the stomach to the small intestine. So I think that was the thinking behind it. But, you know, companies who try to deliver things, biologics to the small intestine, say they're getting good reproducible results in animals anyway. So they they don't see that as a problem. Hmm, Okay. And do both of these pills show the same efficiency in lowering blood sugar levels as if you were to give yourself an injection? They do. But again, these are with animals, so this will have to be studied in people. And in terms of for insulin, as I understand it, diabetics who take insulin will take a couple of different kinds. So there's the, the kind where what we normally think about as a diabetic around a meal will inject insulin to modulate their blood sugar levels. But They also, in many cases, will take a once daily injection, and it's called basal insulin, in order to just provide a baseline amount of the the compound. And so that's what this would be to replace, at least initially. It wouldn't be to replace the insulin you would take with a meal. Both of these technologies are pretty similar in that they're injector pills, but are there any other approaches to an oral formulation being explored right now? Right. So there are these uh, sort of souped up permeation enhancers we talked about before. One of them that just came out last year, a group at Harvard has made this liquid that goes in a capsule with the insulin. And in this case, the liquid is sort of the consistency of honey. So once it reaches the small intestine, the capsule dissolves and that honey-like substance then kind of gloms onto the lining of the small intestine and then works to encourage the insulin to get through well. All these oral formulations are in different stages of development right now, but when do you think we may be able to see some of these on the market? It's likely still going to be years. The first rule of any kind of medicine is first do no harm. So we already know that we have very good delivery systems that use needles and injections, and those work well, and those protect the lives of hundreds of millions of people. So whatever comes next has to be shown to be as safe as those are. So And all those types of medicines will face rigorous safety studies. Once those do pass, however, it could spread quite rapidly because all the companies that are looking at these different kinds of formulations or engineered devices are designing them to work with medicines that are already approved. So if the delivery mechanisms can be shown to be safe, well, then it's conceivable that a number of different kinds of compounds could be delivered this way. And that set of progress could happen very quickly. What is the motivation behind creating these oral formulations? Why is it important to have a pill version of insulin or any of these other biologics? With any medicine, the most important thing is to be able to take the medicine when it's needed, as often as it's needed. And so for something like insulin, you want very high compliance. Anytime you have an injectable medication versus an oral medication, 
Oral medications always have higher compliance because a lot of people don't like needles for obvious reasons. So that's number one. Uh, there's also a, a definitely a motivation for the companies because, or the companies developing these technologies because then they could potentially sell. Uh, they would have massive markets. Because as I said before, depends on the year, but seven or eight of the top 10 selling drugs in the US are biologics. And so these are huge, massive markets. And so there's a lot of money to be made as well. So there's both a lot of health and safety reasons, but a lot of commercial reasons as well. All right. Thank you so much, Bob. Oh, you're welcome, Megan. Anytime. Bob Service is a staff writer at Science. You can find a link to his piece at sciencemag.org slash podcasts. And that concludes this edition of the Science Podcast. If you have any comments or suggestions for the show, write to us at sciencepodcast at aaas.org. And we're still looking for a book reviewer. So if you have radio experience, which means you can record yourself and edit yourself, and you have science background, please do get in touch. We've gotten lots of really nice letters from people saying, I love the podcast, I love the science books, but I don't really know how to edit. And it's just, we need someone to help edit with that. Um, you can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcasts, or you can listen on the science website. That's sciencemag.org slash podcast. To place an ad on the podcast, contact midroll.com. The show was produced by Sarah Crespi and Megan Cantwell and edited by Podigy. Jeffrey Cook composed the music. On behalf of Science Magazine and its publisher, AAAS, thanks for joining us.